Hey guys, welcome to this video. I want to share with you a recent decision. This is from November 3rd out of Ohio. And I don't know this particular judge, Sharon Ovington, uh, but it's a fantastic opinion. And I want you to see it if you're interested in the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and emotional distress damages that come from a debt collector violating the FDCPA, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Now, it also discusses this in the context of standing, which is a huge issue in federal court. It's one reason why we file all of our cases in state court, and I won't repeat a previous video, but we do that because if the defendant then removes it to federal court, they're telling the federal judge, hey, you have jurisdiction over this. And then if they turn around and go, oh, and by the way, you have no jurisdiction over this because there's no standing, the judges look at them like, what's wrong with you? Okay, so it doesn't prevent all the stupid arguments, but it does knock out a lot of them. And so if you're interested in, again, emotional distress and standing, I think you'll like this video. In other words, you'll like this case, this uh, Pastion, I guess is how you say it, versus internal credit systems. This will be a pretty lengthy video just because there's a lot of material. And so if you're interested, then uh, join with me as we go through this. Okay, so this is a case involving the FDCPA. And then the consumer, the plaintiff, has filed a motion for partial summary judgment. And the defendant, the debt collector, says, hey, the consumer lacks standing to bring a claim under the FDCPA. And then there's some other reasons that they argue. So here are some facts. Uh, this consumer goes to a fitness place and they say you can join for a dollar and she declines a three-year membership she does a one-year membership and then she starts having some problems and so she decides hey i'm not going to be a member here anymore well then this debt collector ics sends her a letter saying hey we're a debt collector and it's over three thousand dollars that they're collecting and then they give her a little warning, kind of don't do it exactly right, but this is the 1692G type warning about you have 30 days, blah, blah, blah. And so the consumer says, I read the letter. I was confused by the amount. I didn't know who this company was. So I want, my plan was to call the gym and this had caused me stress and anxiety. But before she contacts the gym, she gets a voicemail message and this guy, uh, Ted Lackman, uh, founded this company about 20 years ago. And uh, he said, look, we're a small operation. Uh, we just do a few calls a day. And so here's the message. Uh, this Ted Lackman giving you a call regarding a legal matter. My number is blah, blah, blah. And then it ended. And in his deposition, the owner of this debt collector was asked, why did you say it's a legal matter? And he said, I want her to know it's a serious matter and she had to know this was serious and call me back. And so the plaintiff says, when I heard that voicemail, I got sick and panicked, uh, thought we had gotten into legal trouble. And so she calls him the next day. Now there's a dispute over what happens. She's going to say that he was cussing at her and saying you know, all sorts of ugly things. And it, it made me anxious. It was embarrassing. I was shocked. And uh, then... You know, he supposedly said I could face jail time and he would see me in court. And uh, the debt collector says I was hallucinating if I thought I was ever getting out of this. And she said, you know, this was just very upsetting. Now, the debt collector says, no, no, no. She was a jerk when she called. OK. And he denied saying he would bring a legal proceeding and did not threaten her with imprisonment. So then she gets another voicemail message. And this is from another person at that company. We need to speak with you immediately regarding a personal business matter. Our number is, and then gives the number. And so uh, the consumer says she told them she had a lawyer. And they said, well, you still owe this money. And so a lawyer sends a letter, what's called a validation letter, or a dispute letter saying, send me some proof. And so uh, some proof was sent. And then this is... In this long paragraph is what the consumer says. This was the effect of all this. In other words, this is how it bothered her. Uh, stressful, uh, made me feel anxious, frustrated, ignored, helpless, confused, offended, embarrassed, depressed. 
uh, worried, uh, shock that he was so hostile, offensive, aggressive. And so I suffered severe emotional and mental distress. So now the court says, okay, we're looking at summary judgment here. So we need to know what the standard is. So the person that's moving for summary judgment, who's saying to the court, there's no reason to have a jury consider this, just summarily enter judgment in my favor, has to show there's no genuine dispute as to any material fact, and you're entitled to judgment as a matter of law. So you have to show that no reasonable trier of fact, that means a jury, if you have a jury trial, or the judge, if you have a bench trial, no reasonable trier of fact could find other than for the moving party. Now, it can get a little complicated because sometimes a moving party can move for summary judgment on something they do not bear the burden of proof at trial. And the court points out, you just have to show that there's an absence of evidence to support the other party's case. And in any event, the evidence, facts, and inferences are viewed in like most favorable to the non-moving party. So if we have kind of equal evidence here, we're going to give the benefit of the doubt to the, the non-moving party. So there's some, some event has happened. And we say, well, we could interpret this in two ways. We need to interpret it in the way most favorable to the non-moving party. So the consumer seeks a partial summary judgment. She just wants to, the judge to say, this debt collector violated the law, but then she wants an actual hearing or a trial on damages. And so how does she win? Well, if she shows the evidence, facts, and inferences, again, viewed in light most favorable to the debt collector, are sufficient for the court to hold no reasonable trier fact could find other than for her on the merits of at least one of her FDCPA claims. And so she brought the case in federal court. And again, remember, my view for many years is we don't bring them in federal court, we bring them in state court. But since she brought in in federal court, she shoulders the burden to establish she has standing under Article 3 of the Constitution. This is a huge issue, just like a a fire out of control in federal courts right now. And you'll see most of this opinion is taking up with this idea of standing. But the reason I want to share this with you is because it has such a fabulous discussion of emotional distress damages that I think it's worth you taking a look at this. So now we're going to look at the FDCPA. So why was it passed? Widespread and serious national problem of debt collection abuse by unscrupulous debt collectors. The goal of the FDCPA is eliminate abusive debt collection practices. So what does it prohibit? Any false, deceptive, misleading representation or means in connection with collection of a debt. And so here's some ideas of or examples of this. You can't lie about the character, amount, legal status. You can't talk about the representation or implication. Non-payment of debt will result in arrest or imprisonment. You can't threaten to take an action that cannot legally be taken or is not intended to be taken. And the false representation or implication consumer committed a crime. And any other harassing, unfair, deceptive practices which enables the courts where appropriate to prescribe other improper conduct which is not specifically addressed. In other words, this statute is worded very broadly to say, if you have a debt collector that's lying, that's harassing, that's being unfair, then that most likely is going to violate the FDCPA. So what do you get? Well, you get statutory or actual damages for violation. So the plaintiff, the consumer here, has, let's see, five different claims. So falsely implying that there's a legal action, number one. Number two, failing to identify itself as a debt collector in those two voicemail messages. Remember, they just say, hey, my name is, and you know, it's a guy's name. Uh, This is a legal matter. This is a business matter. They don't say we're a debt collector. Number three, misrepresenting the character and amount of the debt. Number four, threatening negatively affect her credit. And then number five, these outrageous acts. And so she says, I'm entitled to summary judgment. And the court says, but before we can get there, we have to deal with the debt collector who's challenging your standing. If you don't have standing, then there's no jurisdiction of the court over this lawsuit. And either the entire lawsuit or part of the lawsuit has to be thrown out. So here's Article 3 standing. And uh, there's some kind of technical stuff in here that we'll skip over. And then... 
say the standing question is whether plaintiff has alleged such a personal stake in the outcome of the controversy as to warrant his or her invocation because remember they brought the case in federal court invocation of federal court jurisdiction justify exercise of the court's remedial powers on his or her behalf so that's the standard okay so how do we do this well we show number one an injury in fact number two that's fairly traceable to the conduct so we have to show we've been injured and it was because of what the defendant did and then number three it's likely to be redressed by a favorable decision okay now generally the battles are all over this injury and in fact okay that's where the battles occur and so even the court says parties disagree whether the consumer can show she suffered an injury so the debt collector says the emotional distress sleepless nights fear of jail time anxiety stress is not severe and therefore does not constitute an injury in fact so the whole case gets thrown out so you see how powerful these attacks on standing are it's to destroy your entire case that you brought where the debt collector say don't even worry about whether we violated the law it doesn't matter the whole case gets thrown out so very important to understand this if you're bringing a case in federal court or even in state court that can be removed to federal court you have to understand this or you will absolutely be just ruthlessly attacked by the defendant on the standing issue so an injury in fact so remember back up here we've got these three items and but it really all comes down to injury in fact so it needs to be both concrete and particularized and actual or imminent not just hypothetical in the future so an injury is concrete when it is real and not abstract concrete is not however necessarily synonymous with tangible and tangibles may be easier to recognize but intangible injuries can nevertheless be concrete look this is i think just a terrible path the courts have gone down getting into this because it's very very difficult for them to even articulate but this judge does a really really good job of doing her best to articulate this within the constraints of she's bound by hired decisions all right, so let's go back to it. But injury to plaintiff's wallet is not a prerequisite for standing. So you can get non-financial injuries. And so what I have here in the purple is, when does an intangible injury solidify into a concrete injury? Pretty good sentence, right? So then we have the Sixth Circuit, which is where this case is. Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, Buckholz, I guess. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. I presume that's probably a German name or something. Uh, but anyway, we have the Sixth Circuit case. And they said the plaintiff, the consumer, lacked standing because his alleged anxiety was fear of future harm and appeared to be self-inflicted and was not fairly traceable to defendant's conduct. So then the court said, because of that, we don't have to decide whether just, just mental anguish by itself is enough or is insufficient. And so the judge points out the debt collector ignores that the Sixth Circuit case did not resolve whether anxiety alone can constitute injury. And here's what the debt collector argues in this light blue, that the court explained general allegations of emotional harm, no matter how deeply felt, cannot suffice. And let me just stop here. This is a big problem that we face, particularly with the defendants. They will miscite the law. They will either accidentally because they're sloppy or intentionally they will argue things that are just not true and so we really have to be prepared for this and we can't you know say well i'm so upset that they're doing no this is who they are this is the way that that these defendants argue stuff and so here's another one uh, lack standing because she failed to allege engage in extreme and outrageous conduct and the judge says you're wrong okay the tort law language that you're relying on was not essential to the holding that this consumer in the Buckholz case lacked standing. It merely explained the skepticism over whether anxiety alone may constitute this. And then one judge on the panel, so typically with an appellate decision, there are three judges. So one judge did not agree with that skepticism. He wrote, I cannot join the parts of the opinion that expressed doubt over whether mental anxiety can create a case or controversy. And so this was his point in this last paragraph. If it's sufficiently particularized. So 
we're talking about their specific elements, not just I was upset, but give some detail. And he says, this comports with long tradition of allowing plaintiffs to sue for emotional distress damages, uh, distress, including mental suffering or emotional anguish. It's personal injury familiar to the law, customarily proved by showing the nature and circumstances. That's from 1978. Recovery for that type of injury has been part of our common law tradition for centuries. So here in 1895, there's a collection of cases. Here's 1896 collection of cases. And you can, uh, even without positive bodily harm, you can recover for injury to the feelings and affections for mental anxiety, personal insult, wounded sensibility. And so the, the judge in this current case says, well, this is the tension over whether in FDCPA cases, anxiety alone can constitute an injury, in fact, for standing purposes. And so they say, well, look, there's no need to answer that question directly, but this Buckholtz case gives us some principles, some concepts. So concrete, intangible injuries can flow from statutory violations. Number two, that Congress, by identifying a a harm and saying this is right or wrong doesn't necessarily open the doors to the courthouse for you. So not all procedural violations open the door, but some do. Number four, a violation of procedural right that protects a concrete interest, then you don't need to allege any additional harm beyond the one Congress has identified. And there's no bright line rule. So the they look at two factors from Spokio. Spokio is a Supreme Court decision that really sort of uh, jump-started all this standing type issue, is whether an intangible injury is concrete, namely the history of common law and the judgment of Congress. So going back to this Buckholtz case, looks at judgment of Congress, and there can be procedural rights and a cause of action to vindicate those. And so the FDCPA was designed to prevent uh, abusive debt collection practices. In this Buckholtz case, to try to wrap its hands around this, says, well, let's let's try to give some examples and kind of lay it out on a, a, uh, a spectrum, if you will. And so first, we have this Hagee case. The lender's attorney sent a letter saying they would the plaintiffs uh, would not have to pay the balance owed. Now, the attorney did not identify that he was a debt collector. That violates the law. But Sixth Circuit says, hey, no harm, no foul. As that was good news. You don't have to pay any more money. So you don't have standing to come into federal court. And then they look at this Macy case and they say, well, that's uh, at sort of the other end of the spectrum. The Macy plaintiffs alleged a procedural violation it turned out to be an injury in fact. And so this had to do with sort of your timing and how you had to dispute certain things to get rights uh, under the FDCPA. And so it's uh, placed them at a materially greater risk of falling victim to abusive debt collection practices. And then we have this Damaris case. And so that's only intangible injuries, but it's a concrete injury because the debt collector attempted to use civil judicial proceedings to collect a debt he did not owe. And so that's a harm Congress intended to prevent. And it's something that the common law, which is sort of the law that was in existence when the country was formed. And then the judge says, well, let's go back to this Buckholtz case. So what was the injury in fact there? And they said, there's no Article Three standing. So the case gets thrown out. So what happened is collector sends a plaintiff a collection letter giving the false impression attorney had reviewed the case and confirmed the plaintiff owed the debts. And the Sixth Circuit said, well, we're going to assume that that violates the FDCPA, but it's, it's again, no harm, no foul, because plaintiff gave no reason to find he did not owe the debt. And I think that's a very weak reason, okay? But that's what they're saying here. And number two, he did not allege an omission or misstatement caused him to waive a procedural right. And so there was no kind of common law violation this doesn't fit any tort law type theory. And so they throw this out. So now the judge comes back to her case and says, all right, with all that background, now let's see what are we doing here. So claim number one. Remember, there were five claims. So the voicemail message violated 
these different sections of section 1692E by implying the existence of a legal action. He said legal matter. And the court says, well, you know, you're saying that's kind of like malicious prosecution. That's where you sue somebody and you have no basis. But then the court says, but here's where you fall apart. Uh, This just is a bare procedural violation. There's no risk of real harm because there was nothing that you waived your rights on. And the court says, your worry about the future, that's not enough. Now, again, I don't agree with this, but she's bound by the Sixth Circuit opinion, the Buckholz decision. And so future events just are not enough in this context. So her legal matter could not generate concrete harm without future action. And so he says, I'm throwing out your claim one. Now, how about claim two? That's a voicemail. Because remember, the debt collector did not say, I'm a debt collector, and this is an attempt to collect a debt. And the judge says, you're right. You know, Congress said, hey, this is a very important right, okay, under Section 692E11. And this is analogous to common law fraud because you're lying by deceiving somebody. Okay, So it's established to protect concrete interests. So they must disclose in communications that they're a debt collector. And here's the risk. Omission of information create a risk she might volunteer detrimental information when she returned his phone. Because remember, she doesn't know who this person is. He's just like, hey, I have very important legal matter, have business matter. You need to call me back. Well, she might have called thinking it's something else. He talks to her and she's not on guard. It's sort of like the the Miranda warning that police have to give you. Hey, you know, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used again. That type of thing. This is called the mini Miranda, like the miniature Miranda rights. So you don't want to be in a situation where you might volunteer information that could hurt you. Now, claim number three is arguing about the amount of the debt, okay? And she says, hey, uh, they're trying to collect more than they're entitled to. And the judge says, yep, you're right, okay? Because this is a very serious matter. Number four is, and and I want to focus on this for a moment. The debt collector threatened to negatively report credit information, even though it knew she disputed the debt. And so... E5 says you can't threaten to take an action which legally cannot be taken. And E8 says threatening to communicate to any person, which would include a credit bureau, credit information which is known or should be known to be false, including, this is really key right here, including the failure to communicate a disputed debt is disputed. And she says this is like abusive process or malicious prosecution and Uh, You know, having inaccurate credit information is a red flag to other creditors. And look what I have here in red. I know it's not the easiest to read, but I want it to stand out. These negative effects can be so severe that even a threat by a debt collector to report disputed information is an inherently abusive, injurious, and coercive shakedown because it forces the debtor with the legitimate ground for disputing the debt to choose between waiving the right to challenge the debt or risk long-lasting negative financial consequences. This type of concrete harm falls on the Macy end of the spectrum, and so you have a concrete injury. Now, I will say this. You don't have to to state specifically what you're disputed. You can just say, I dispute the debt. And if a debt collector reports it without marking it as disputed, you have a claim here. And the judge's point is that if they refuse to mark it as disputed, now, you're in this problem because do you, do you have to pay the money? Okay, because otherwise they'll trash your credit. And so when the debt collector says, oh, you know, credit reporting, that's not really harmful. That's not really collecting. This is very powerful language for that. All right, then claim number five about the, the threats and the profanity. And judge said, yep, you have standing for that. Okay, because we normally allow emotional distress damages under the FDCPA. And there's some language in here about Congress was very concerned about marital instability, invasions of privacy. The Senate committee noted that abusive debt collectors cause suffering and anguish. We have all this emotional toll. And so it makes sense that you would get uh, emotional distress damages. So the judge says, you've got standing 
to litigate claims two through five. All right, now, what about on the actual claims? Well, remember claim one, the judge said that gets thrown out. So claim two, judge says you get summary judgment, consumer, because that's just a clear violation in that voicemail message to not identify yourself as a debt collector. So there's only one conclusion. You violated 1692E11. And claim four, remember that's on the credit reporting. When you threatened a credit report without marking it as disputed, that absolutely violates E8. Now the other two claims, they say, well, she says he did it, he says he didn't do it, so now a jury has to decide that. So that's the end of the case. I'll put a link to this decision. It's just a very, very important decision if you're dealing in FDCPA cases and you're dealing with the standing arguments and emotional distress. So hope that that's helpful and I will get back into doing more of these case decisions. Last couple of weeks have been just crazy with tons of court cases and lawsuits to file. And so I've just been behind on that. So I appreciate your patience and we'll do more of these longer videos and we'll mix in some short videos as well. So appreciate you guys watching this and I will catch you in the next video. Okay, have a good one. Bye-bye.